Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we continue our study in Judges 16, in the example of Samson, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more properly understand the symbols that are being presented in this passage <coughs> and may be able to apply these to that which we are seeing today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for this opportunity we have to learn, <clears throat> to be guided, to be blessed by the words and the examples that you are providing. Father, we ask for your spirit, for we need your Holy Spirit so that our minds may be open, that we may come to understand that which you would show us. Our minds need to be enlightened. Our minds need to be opened to that which you would have us to understand. So that as we see and as your spirit uncovers the examples that are before us, we might be able to accept these examples for what they are, for these figures we need to see so that they may be properly applied for the time in which we are living. Guide us now. May your angels attend us. Help us. So that we may put these together in a manner so that we may all understand them. May our faith be strengthened. May we be able to use these items to more properly represent your character to all with whom we come in contact. We ask, Father, for your guidance in many ways. We ask, Father, for answers to prayer in many situations. Be with us now, for we accept your promise that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. So please join with us at this time. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Yesterday, we began opening up Judges chapter 16. Now, <clears throat> please consider something. <clears throat> what did we determine at the close of Judges 15? What was the Bible and the spirit of prophecy very clear about at the end of Judges 15? Are you talking about the 20 years? Yes. Okay, so, well, those 20 years... Um, they occur during the period of 40 years. But was it not very clearly presented that at the time after Samson's revenge upon the Philistines for the murder of his Philistine wife and her 
father's household. That the children of Israel then chose Samson to be judge over them. It's at that point that they chose Samson to be judge? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I don't I don't remember that. Is it not uh, yeah. Is it not after he slays the one thousand with the twelve yes. one? That's correct. So Is it not after that that he's then chosen to be judge. That is correct. So then he's judged for 20 years after that. So, um, okay. So I'm not sure that fits in exactly. Okay. Signs of the Times, October 6th, 1881, paragraph 15. After this victory, the Israelites made Samson judge over them and he ruled Israel for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm saying is I don't know where in those 40 years this occurs. We know that they occur during the 40 years. But as, as we have been addressing, Samson was entering into the time of manhood where he felt capable of entering into a marriage covenant, right? Mm-hmm. He goes to his parents and said, get her to be my wife. He would have been somewhere in his late teens, possibly into the early 20s, but easily into the late teens. Because you don't expect, let's say, a child of seven to 10 to uh, to wish to get married. Yeah. So let's say he was 20. Okay. And then... How do we know how long all this this other occurred? Well, if he was 20 and then he judges Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years, then would that not cover the majority of the 40 years of Philistine domination? Yeah, and, and so, yeah, so that means we could put it that basically when he's born is at the time they're under Philistine rule, right? Correct. And then he's going to be about 20. And so by the end of that period, um, when he dies, so that would have put the end to Philistine rule. All right. Is that kind of what we're saying? That's, I mean, that's what I'm looking at at this point. Okay. So basically you take that 40 and divide it into 20 and 20. So my question becomes in this situation, if <clears throat> Judges 15 is showing us the beginning of Samson's time as a judge, then is Judges 16 showing us the close of his time as a judge? Well, yes. So the chapter 16 would be the time that he is a judge. And of course, it's going to end with his death. So he's not going to be a judge after his death. So that would be the 20 years. It, it, that, that's the end of that 20 years. Right occur with this situation with Delilah and how long he does it say how long he's there in prison it does not tell us that so we don't know exactly well I we, it wouldn't be very long but no it, it couldn't be very long yeah now Samson goes to Gaza. He goes to see a harlot. The people of Gaza or Gaza are very aware of what he's doing. They wish to destroy him. 
He's awakened at midnight. He removes the gate with its posts, with its bar, and carries it to a hill near Hebron. Now that's where we were we were approaching things yesterday. I believe the the determination that we had yesterday was that the distance from Gaza to Hebron was about 37 miles. I think you said 60 kilometers, right? 60 clicks? Yeah, something like that. Like, uh, yeah. Now, the people of Gaza were told. And it was told the Gazaites saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were silent all that night saying, in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. Now, As we read through here, we were to the point where in going through the spirit of prophecy that we are seeing one wrong step prepares the way for another. Samson had transgressed the command of God by taking a wife from the daughters of the Philistines. And before long, he ventured again among that people. Now, they are his deadly enemies. They are no longer his friends. They are no longer his associates. He is not one that is conversant with them. They hate him with a white hot passion. They want him destroyed. But it is his passion, his unlawful passions, that are leading to his destruction. Trusting confidently in his great strength, which had inspired the Philistines with such terror, he boldly entered Gaza, one of the largest and most powerful cities, and visited a harlot of that place. What symbols do we see here? How often has the church and the movement trusted in something that have been the blessings of God? Just like Samson trusting in his great strength. Did the message of July 18th bring a message of terror to some of those in Nashville? Mm -hmm. Was the proclamation of this with July 18th, a bold proclamation. Yes. Were we as a movement relying upon our wisdom and our strength in giving this proclamation? No, I wouldn't say so. I think it could be said both ways, yes and no. Yeah. 
Had the church at any time relied upon the blessings of God without the direction of God? I mean, at this at this point, I mean, I look at I look at the message that was given to Mrs. White about this with Nashville. The church understood that she was a prophet, but there were many times that when she gave instruction that the church did not really wish to promote or espouse that instruction because they found it to be an embarrassment. The message of July 18th when it was first given in 1905 was something that the church accepted, but they really didn't go out of their way to make sure that this message went out. When this was being first addressed, the church through a couple of people that are directly associated with the church, Steve Wolberg and Don Frost, began to give some messages about what would happen to Nashville, but nothing national. Again, trying to sleep, sweep this under the rug. But here is Samson. <clears throat> he has now gone, to, gone down to Gaza to visit a harlot. This disgraceful fact was soon made known to the inhabitants of the city who were eager to be avenged upon their dreaded foe. They looked that if you have attacked the men in Ashkelon, or you have slain a thousand with the jawbone of an ash, that you are now our enemy. Fearing to attack him, they sent for reinforcements and kept a vigilant watch at the gate of the city, determined by some means to put him to death <clears throat> in the morning. Samson was aroused at midnight. The accusing voice of conscience filled him with remorse as he remembered that he had broken his vow as a Nazarite. Is this the second time that he's broken his vow as a Nazarite? That we're told of. Yeah. But despite his sin, God's mercy had not forsaken him. God is not forsaking us at this time. His great strength <clears throat> again served to deliver him. Wrenching the city gate from its place, he took it entire, the whole thing, with its posts and bars and carried it several miles to the top of a hill on the way to Hebron. The guards, meanwhile, being too surprised and terrified to intercept or pursue him. Think about that in your mind's eye. Here is one man. You have all of these men of the city of Gaza with reinforcements. They, as a group, 
are looking to put Samson to death. Samson comes up to the city gate, which is closed, and he tears the gate from the ground. He then carries the gate, its bars, its posts, its everything, several miles. And they do nothing. They're terrified at what's going on. What can be symbolized by the gates to this with Gaza? Well, so when we, I mean, because what we talked about yesterday is, is I'm taking that this is representative of Christ. Right. And um, so Samson going down to a harlot's a bad thing. But in this context, we could, we could take it as representing the church, the Jews, right? No disagreement. And... Um, and this this taking of the gate of the city, which is um, this well, it would be a symbol of a number of things, but but to me, it still represents that seventieth week. It's going to represent these these two posts, and with this door in the middle, and Jesus is the gate. Right, he's the door of the sheep. And this would be him taking uh, access by come, becoming a man be, and, and beginning his ministry um, to conquer Satan, his kingdom. But is this also not considering the, the gate of the city could either keep people in or keep people out, right? Right. So by removing this gate, by removing the gate, the posts, and the bars, people could freely leave Gaza. Mm -hmm. Is this also not a type of calling out? Mm -hmm. Showing people that you need to leave this. And, and yeah, and this would be the access to God. I mean, even when we have the temple of the veils rent in twain, or right. Jesus behind the door of the sheep. I mean, this has to do with, with access to God. A gate is a door. It's, it's a way of access, either of exit or entrance, and both could be applied here, depending on how we understand this city. But we know, you know, Gaza means strength, and 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 so so we know that Samson, in representing Christ, I mean, he comes against the strength of of this world, right? Right. And and of course, we have all the symbols here: midnight, um, uh, them seeking his life. And him also carrying the gate would be a parallel to carrying the cross. Okay. So, so those are the ideas, at least, that we're looking at. Why do you think the guards were, were surprised and terrified? And what kind of a symbol would we see there? You've never encountered anything like it. The message that Christ gave to the children of Israel was a message unlike any other because everything that they were holding on to at that time had been obscured by men. They didn't understand the pure message. They didn't understand the straight message that God had given either the message at the Garden of Eden 
through Noah, through Abraham, or through Moses. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were terrified because if he did away with all of the the minutia that they had applied to the law, then the law would become very simple. It would be very direct and it would point out their sins. Here is Samson. He's aroused because of his sin. He knows that he has <clears throat> broken his vow as a Nazarite. He was not to drink of the vine. He was not to have his hair cut off. He was to honor God in everything that he did. By choosing a wife of the Philistines, he was not honoring God. By going down to see a harlot, he was not honoring God. He was not living according to the way that God would want him to live. Yet God was not abandoning him. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. Now, it's, it's interesting when, when I was looking over some maps, if I've understood this correctly, and I'm, I'm more than willing to be corrected here, that the Valley of Sarek looked to be within the territory of the Israelites, not in the territory of the Philistines. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him or to humble him. And we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Uh, just dealing with the Valley of Sarek, it, it's a boundary between the Israelites and the Philistines. Okay. Right. So it's, it's on the border. It divides the two. Okay. Good point. So Samson is in the border. Is there any middle ground as far as God is concerned? No. Because the middle ground is sitting on the fence and the devil owns the fence. Right. Time will tell. Mm -hmm. Samson's strength was put into the middle ground by Samson himself. How many major cities were there as far as the Philistines were concerned? Five? Correct. So if the lords of the Philistines came up to her and made this offer, it is possible that there were five lords approaching her each offering 1,100 pieces of silver.
you're not talking 1100 on its own. You're talking more than that, if I'm reading this correctly. But here again, I don't read the Hebrew. Yeah, that's that's how it's understood that there's yeah 5500 being offered her. So what symbol can we take from the 5500 pieces of silver? <laughs> I mean, we know that 30 pieces of silver was offered for Christ, right? What can we see from, from 5,500 pieces of silver? Well, two fives remind me of five wise and five foolish. All right. Fifty-five is also, if when it's added to forty-five, would make up a hundred. We have forty-five on the eighteen forty-three chart. Would this be the opposite of the 45, but still in relation to 100, which would be 10 by 10, or that to signify a test of tests? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, so, I mean, to, I mean, I've never really seen this symbol before, you know, other than the fives, but, um, and again, with the weights and measures, it's not hard to know exactly how much this is, because there's so much discrepancy, but, um, I would think, uh, what would be the symbol of 11? Well, you had 11 disciples after Judas's suicide. Okay. You had 11 brothers remaining after Joseph was sold into slavery. Okay. So what would the 11 represent then? One of the things I would like to figure out. Okay, from the chat. Could the 11 represent betrayal? Hmm. Could 1100 represent betrayal? Well, we have uh, Genesis 11, so that becomes a symbol. That's the Tower of Babel. Right. So it can symbolize a rebellion, even though 13 is usually the number of rebellion, but maybe betrayal. Um, I don't know. Okay. We, we, get, a, we get 1,100 shekels. 
what's that? Stephen? In the next chapter, I think. So is, is this is going back in time now. We right. Get, we get the mention of 1100 shekels. I think it's in the next chapter. And that's uh, a thing to do with that, uh, the Levite who was, um, he was given money, I think, from the Danites or something there. And uh, so this is going back maybe a couple of hundred years or so. Right. Micah. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Because there were 11, 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee about what, which thou cursest, because this was the money that was taken from his mother. Yeah, so, so one thing about the 11, you do have the 11 years. Right, and of course, um, uh, we have the 11 years that... Uh, both Jehoiakim and Zedekiah reigned, which are symbols. But we have the 11 years in the story of Joseph that divides the two, the 22 years. Um, so, so. I'm not sure exactly how we would apply this. If we're going to apply it to this movement at this time, what 11 would represent? Well, just like what, what Stephen was saying, when we looked at this initially in Judges 17, mm -hmm. that 1,100 shekels of silver were then, told it, were, were then turned into a molten image, a graven image. Yeah. In fact, a graven image and a molten image. So is this coming to Delilah, coming to a woman, a symbol of a church, of a, you know, a perverse church, not a, not a true church, giving 1,100 pieces of silver times five. Is this representing idolatry? No. I mean, at the at the beginning of the period of the judges, we have this situation with what is being represented in Judges 17. Toward the close of the period of the judges, we again have 1,100 pieces of silver being addressed. At the beginning, the 1,100 pieces of silver were turned into idols and molten images. And it's kind of weird, you know, 1,100, why they choose that. And, and of course, you have the 1,100, as we noted in the next chapter. So there's something about this 1100, um, obviously as a symbol, but I, there must be some practical reason why they use this number. Right. Um, now in uh, John Gill, just dealing with uh, measurements of this, right? So, you know, because the first question is how, how much does this weigh? Um, so maybe 700 pounds sterling. Um, Boy, that's quite a bit. Yeah, of the, the 5.5 piece of silver. So that would be quite a bit. We don't know exactly. William, oh, OK, never mind. Um, So trying to put that into um, uh, so I mean a pound sterling. What exactly is a pound sterling?
Anybody know what that is? Like, I mean, are we are we speaking in reference to uh, British money in pounds? I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what that means. I mean, obviously, it would mean different things at different times. So when this was done, I mean, that would actually refer to silver itself, right? Well, it's a method, a medium of exchange is the pound sterling. Well, yeah, but at the time the commentary is written, uh, it would have been actual silver though, right? Not, not a paper note or whatever. So is it 700 pounds silver is what that I'm asking. I'm thinking that your commentary is referring more to what you'd find in, in, in British exchange. Well, yeah, but back then, wasn't it based upon the actual weight of silver? At that point, it would have been tied to it, yes. Right, so that's, that's what I'd have to find out what he, he means by 700 pounds sterling. Um, See, right? just, it's going to be different than what pound sterling is today because money has been uh, completely devalued. Well, the current, uh, yeah, because the, the, def the difference in, in rate, it used to be, at, well, at one point that the British pound was worth five U.S. dollars. Yeah, but five U.S. dollars were worth a lot more money than now. Exactly. So I'm, I'm just saying I don't know how to convert it into the present amount. Um, the, current, the current conversion, a pound sterling, is worth a dollar, 8.85 of a U.S. dollar. Yeah, so that's not very much money if no. we take that. But when you're talking about 700 pounds sterling in, you know, the mid 1800s, um, right? Then that's that's a different thing. So I just don't know how to convert that. I'd have to take some time to figure it out. So he's saying it's worth 700 pounds, the British pounds, right? At that time, Correct. he's doing a conversion, uh, figuring out what it would be worth. Um, so we'd have to compare the currency then with the currency now. So. Things that I'm finding just looking at it roughly, you know, be like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, something like that. But you know, it's hard to say. Well, it's <clears throat> let's just we we can agree that even at that time, this was a lot of currency. Yeah, she was being offered what we could say in the in in the vernacular a king's ransom to help the philistines defeat samson mm -hmm. she's offered a lot however much it was it was a lot of money yeah right so when they're saying to entice him Here again, we would go back to Judges 14, 15. <clears throat> and it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have you called us to take that we have? Is it not so? So they threatened Samson's wife, they bribe Delilah. But there are several points from the book of Proverbs that are also very clear. Proverbs 2, 16 to 19, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger that flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. 
for her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. Samson here is choosing a path that is not of God. So for the third time, he is setting aside his vow as a Nazarite. Right? Mm -hmm. For the way we're being shown this in this book. Yeah. And Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Now, there must have been something really special about this woman, because she comes at him direct. She does not hide what she wants to know. She is saying to him, point blank, tell me why you're so strong. And Samson said unto her, if they bind me with seven green worths that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. So seven new cords or seven moist cords. Where else did we see something that was moist? Well, there was the jawbone of the ass. Right. Um, now here... Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it just says that he's never been dried. Um, so we don't really have moist here, per se. I mean, okay. in, in Hebrew, we just have that they had not been dried. Now, one of the comments from the chat going back to what we were talking about on 11 was kind of interesting. That a fourth witness for 11 being that of betrayal is that if we square 11, we come up to 121. Now, what would 121 mean? The way it's being presented, it would, it would look to be a number of betrayal, right? The 12th day of the first month. So that would be January 12th, 2023. Also, it's the 12th day of the first month is when Judas betrays Christ. It's also uh, 12th day of the first month is um, Miller. That's where he believed that the crucifixion occurred. Um, but it, and, and that's why he had from the river Ahava, that's he, he had as the going forth of the commandment, because that occurs on the 12th day of the first month. So, I mean, it, it becomes a significant symbol in that sense. Okay. And so, you know, and that's kind of an interesting thing about Colin's prediction. Not that he actually sets the date of January 11th, but it's going to be that borderline between January 11th and the start of January 12th that the 65 inclusive days would end. If he's going to have his mirror uh, be chronological, then that would mark the beginning of January 12th as the end of Colin's prediction. And of course, it's 2,640 days to the beginning of April 5th, 2030. So, um, so this, as far as applying to this to this movement then, um, what, how could we, if we're going to take that symbol as relevant to that, what would this be if we're going to address it as this movement? What would this bribe be about? What if Delilah represents the corporate church? 
that is then betraying the movement into the hands of the world. Well, I'm not sure how how you would. I mean, if we're going to apply it to Collins' prediction, the corporate church isn't involved. But what is involved is a false system of study. Okay. And this would be enticing this movement, this message. Um, okay, we're looking at that from two different angles, and your angle may be more correct. Um, so, because that's what I would look at, because Samson's is, is being presented with a temptation. Now, Christ also was presented with temptations. Right. And so, now, now of course, it's going to be Delilah herself who's being offered this. But she's going to be offered this. Uh, sort of as a medium to get to Samson. Right, because she's going to entice him. That's the idea. Now, this this word entice, um, uh, it means deceive, allure, persuade, flatter. Uh, literally, it means to open, uh, that is, causatively make roomy but usually figuratively in a mental or a moral sense. So, so what, what, what she's doing in enticing him, um, because there's, it, this is a mental issue or a moral issue. And so this, this, these um, 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, the fact that there's five, I would still say that, you know, the five primarily would be the five wise or the five foolish, right? That's what it normally represents. So I don't know if we, we can take the 5,500 because it's not actually presented. What is presented is 1,100 pieces of silver. And also, we know that there's going to be five lords of the Philistines. Agreed. So I don't know if the 5,500 is, is as, as important as a symbol, because it's not really directly being presented here. But the 1,100 is. Yeah, the 1,100 is. So there's a symbol here that ties us with Judges 17 that occurred a couple of hundred years at least possibly more than before this situation with samson mm -hmm. but it would have been a symbol that the children of israel would have understood yeah this so the, i mean there's things now that we just we're not that information in it hasn't been directly passed down, but there would be a symbol here. They would understand it as a symbol and, and we can see the connection. And however long it was, I think it's like 300 years or something, but um, so we have these, these two stories where we get 1100. Well, the one says, um, I can't remember what the amount, what the unit is. Uh, I think it's shekels. If I remember, um, but anyway, it's eleven 1 hundred pieces of silver here. It's I mean, it's a little bit different. It says you know silver, but but the point is that that eleven 1 hundred must mean something. I mean, it it's, can't just be an arbitrary number that they chose. Okay, um, they may have even understood it as a symbolic number that. Um, uh, because these are the lords of the Philistines choosing this. And so they may have attached some symbolic uh, significance to offering her that amount. Right. Now, in response to what you were just saying, 
from Judges 17, shekel was an added word. Okay, so it just says, what does it say there then? Um, just 11, oh, 1100 of silver. So it's the same thing. Yeah, so, so again, it's going to be the exact same amount. Right. Okay. Okay. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green worths, seven green new cords, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Yeah. So they'd be probably bowstrings or something like that, but it's just either in Hebrew. So, so these are things that haven't been cured. Okay. And um, now, of course, this is going to be the first, I don't know, joke he plays on her. I don't know how we would characterize what Samson's doing. Well, he's not, he is not being honest with her. He is concealing things from her. Mm -hmm. Is he, in a manner of speaking, testing her? But is he paying attention, is he paying attention to the very test that he's giving? Yeah, it's like, well, I mean, he could just not tell her anything. But of course, right. tell her some false things. Um, so he's kind of playing a joke on her. I mean, he, one is he's testing her, though, to see what she's going to do. Because, I mean, if he tells her something and then she does it, well, then he would know, okay, yeah, she's just trying to find out this information uh, so that the Philistines can, you know, kill me, right? So he would know, at least in the first one, he would be testing her. But the fact is, you know, he's going to finally tell her when he must know by then what her intentions are completely. Well, okay, this, this following verse. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. So they were, they, these Philistines were waiting for him to be bound. And they're in her house. And she saith unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the cords as a thread of tow is broken when it touches or smelleth fire. So his strength, the source of his strength, was not known. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean, thread of tow? What is, what is that from the Hebrew? Um, well, a thread just means like a lace. And, and then toe is uh, um, flax. Okay. It's the refuse of flax. So. so he breaks this as if it was really nothing whatsoever. Yeah. It's just like a little piece. It's like a thread, you know, like a, just a, a, yeah, it's nothing. So, and it says like a thread when it toucheth the fire. Right. That's like, you just put it by a candle. It just breaks right away. Okay. So here she is. She knows that the Philistines are within her own house. She's seeking to betray Samson right from the outset. So her intent is being clearly revealed within this story. Mm -hmm. Samson's reliance upon his strength, but the further reliance, the, 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 the further that he has given himself to passion is also being very clearly revealed. We're looking at this right now, that this has occurred after his Philistine wife and her father's house 
had been destroyed. He's had years to consider what's happening. And he has not learned a lesson from it. I mean, he's maybe he's learned part of a lesson, but he's not really cognizant of how much God has blessed him. Because he's been, he's become too reliant upon himself. Now, as symbols, though, of, of a test, I mean, I, I don't know how we would apply this. At least I haven't, I haven't looked at these different things that, that happen. I mean, you're going to have these, um, these bowstrings, and then you're gonna have the new robes, and um, um, you know, he's braided into his hair, whatever it is. Um, you know, so he's is, which is really ridiculous. But <laughs> um, I'm not sure what these would represent, other than we can take that these can represent lines, right? Okay. So, so if we're dealing with messages that, um, because all of these involve some sort of, of, of rope or something, right? Correct. Right. So you got, you got the bowstrings, you have the rope and I mean, we haven't got there. I always jump ahead, but, uh, and then you're going to have this weaving which I think would be like yarn woven into his hair. Um, or just maybe his hair itself being woven. I don't know. But in all of these, we can see the symbols of, of lines, right? Some kind right. of prophetic message. I've got some verses we might want to look up in the chat referring to the burning flax in Matthew, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Okay, so as you as you're presenting these within the chat, what are you seeing beside this being dealing with burning flax? How does this symbolically? I'd just like to know what the burning flax would mean. As Christ referred to it, but he was quoting from Isaiah. Yeah. And here we have a mention of burning flax again in Judges. Well, and you have... So the, this yeah, it's referring to judgment, judgment onto truth. Well, the, sim the, the, the one here that would be the most significant um, is Ezekiel 40, verse 3, which is uh, Ezekiel's vision of the new temple being built. And you have this uh, man who has a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, which we know is 126 inches. Mm. So, so we know the idea that this is a line. Um, but that's what's represented by these bowstrings, by the rope, and by this weaving. Um, and each time it's sort of more complex, because a thread compared to a rope, a rope is a bunch of threads, more line upon line. And then, of course, the weaving is a more complicated structure. So all of these are testing um, in some ways they're testing Samson as well as testing Delilah. So I don't know exactly how to, how, what these would represent in our history. Okay. Now, 
And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Delilah is upset because she is not getting paid for her betrayal. She saw this 5,500 pieces of silver, this ransom within her reach, and then all of a sudden, it's no longer within her reach. Now it's not just what is the source of your strength. Because here in Judges 16, 6, tell me, I pray thee, wherein that great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Now the question is more blunt. Tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. I just don't want to know where your strength is from. I want to know how you can be taken prisoner. I want to know how you can be captured. Passion is a cruel master. Unbridled passion, even more cruel. Delilah is basically being blunt. I want to know how you can be taken prisoner. And Samson is seeing something in this woman, something that is not, you know, it's not good. He's again breaking his vow as a Nazarite, and it's to his detriment. And he said unto her, if they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. He returns to this with ropes. So if they bind me fast with new ropes, wherewith work hath not been done. Ropes that have never been used. Then shall I be weak and be as another man. Samson knows he's not telling her the whole story. He's not telling her the truth. In this case, is he giving a fair representation of God's character? And if not, whose character is he really representing? Okay. Well, I mean, I know the problem here is that we have the moral aspect of the story. Right. And then we have the symbolic aspect of the story. Right. So it's hard sort of sorting between the two. I mean, right. in the moral aspect of the story, he's not representing God. I mean, he's not following what he's supposed to be doing, but in, in the literal way, but in, in the symbolic way, um, you know, Samson's testing Delilah as much as Delilah's testing Samson. Now, if we align this with Christ, I mean, Christ does yield to the cross. And Samson, in this sense, is going to give the secret of his strength. That is, he's going to make himself vulnerable. So we could look at what Samson's doing as symbolic of a message. What kind of a message? Well, it would be a positive message. It would be the message that that answers to um, 
the deceits of Delilah, the false message. The question that's being asked in the chat, do these ropes represent untested doctrines? Well, I would still think they represent the lines, okay. but a much more line upon line than a thread would be. And this could represent sort of a progression of the messages within our movement. So I'm not going to look at these as, as negative things. I'm going to look at them as positive things. So, you know, you go from a thread to a rope, and then you're going to go to a weaving, and, and that's going to be the, um, the idea of the web is that's the warp. Um, and then the woof is uh, the threads that are, are brought through the warp, if I remember correctly. So you have the warp and the woof. So the warp is uh, your main lines, and then with the woof, that's where you 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 thread the lines through. Um, unless I got it backwards, but I think you're right. Yeah. So his hair is going to be woven into uh, this this loom, right? So, so that would represent a much more advanced aspect of the message. But the cutting of the hair of Samson, I mean, if he's typifying Christ, that's his yielding, intentionally yielding to the cross. You know, we haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so this would just be another way of not yielding to the cross? Were you saying you must bind me with new cords? No, I, I, I would be saying that these are representing messages that are given. Um to test God's people. So, I mean, I don't know specifically, you know, if we're going to take it into the life of Christ that we could name what these are as events, and, and maybe we could. But we're going to see that, at least within our movement, there's this progression of the lines. And, and it could be the progression of the message of Christ. They could represent... Um, different events in the life of Christ. But finally, you're going to have, you know, Christ does die. He has three and a half years, right, from when he's baptized to when um, he dies. And it could represent those that period of time as well. And he has the seven locks of, of his head, that are going to be woven in and those seven can represent the seven years of Christ's ministry as well. So I know it's, it's rather difficult when you're dealing with these symbols in, in this sort of uh, subjective and, and somewhat vague way, but I mean, we have to decide what, what, how we're going to interpret this. And there are lots of things that would symbolize um, uh, that Samson represents Christ. But we would have to apply it to this movement. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber. And he brake them from off his arms like a thread. So 
second time. Philistines are waiting for him. Second time, these supposed restraints are tossed aside as if they are nothing. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head within the web. And she fastened it with the pin, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep, and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. Now, what does this mean in the Hebrew, the pin of the beam and within the web? What are they referring to here? Yeah, so, um, well, the web would refer to the, the warp. And uh, now, when it talks about... Um, uh, let me see here. And can't see it here. So the beam refers to uh, the shuttle and the pin. Well, that would be the peg or the nail or the paddle. So um, I, I've never done weaving. I, I mean, I've, I've seen it uh, occur. So, so this is just referring to the whole loom and the different parts of it. So you have the pin or the paddle. That's where you, you, you thread through the, uh, the, the warp, right? So you have these strings going out all parallel. And then you have this uh, the pin, whatever that you weave through um, uh, through these through this warp, and then this beam or the shuttle is the thing that sort of pushes it all together. If I remember correctly, I'm not sure how that works though. All right. But is that addressing the question? I mean, how out of the Hebrew, what is this what is this trying to say to us? Well, it, it just says, you know, the word pin, that just means through, uh, to pin through or fast, a peg, a nail. I mean, this can refer to, of course, the nails on the cross. Um this the weaving a braid also a shuttle the beam the weaver's shuttle um and then and then of course the web is means a spreading out or expanded that is the wharf of a loom as stretched out to receive the woof so I've never heard the term weaver's shuttle. So apparently that's a, a cross member that goes up and down or goes across from a frame as you're weaving something. Yeah. Um, so let me see if I, I got an image here of how this loom works. So the shuttle, uh, the thing that I think of as the shuttle is the thing when you when you thread through the the pin, right through the different things. The shuttle comes down and pushes down the fabric. That's what I understand. Okay. But you'll see, you'll see way more complex machinery, um, you know, depending on what kind of of loom you're using. Okay. 
Um, so, I mean, there's some very basic, so, I mean, I think it would just be a little loom that he would have had, you know, something like a handheld one. Um, and she wove his hair through this, this, uh, the warp, which is these strings coming down. And so this whole thing, he just took the whole thing with him. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, there's all kinds of different sort of looms that could be used. Um, I'm just looking at different diagrams. Yeah, they're, they can be quite complex looms. Uh, so basically, a weaving shuttle is a stick. Yep, or or a paddle or <coughs> a needle. It's just it, it's designed in such a way that it's easy to thread through the the warp. Okay. Right? So you take your threads and you're going to thread them through the warp, and then the shuttle is going to come down and press press those threads together. Okay. Right. So, so, cause I've seen it, I've seen one in operation. Um, given our conversations in the past about two sticks, I'm just looking at this. I mean, basically that stick is a type of a guide. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the idea of a shuttle, I mean, I mean, a, a shuttle I usually think of as, as something that, you know, it's going to move back and forth. Okay. So. Um, but it means that those two sticks, the one that moves back and forth and the stick that is used as a guide have mm -hmm. to be used in order to be able to properly weave the yarn mm -hmm. yeah yeah just every picture i see these all these complicated diagrams okay yeah. now we are coming close to the close of our time together today do we have any other thoughts or any other questions with what we have been addressing Yeah, he, anyway, here they're saying that the shuttle is the device used in weaving to carry the weft yarn. Um, the filling thread is wound on a bobbin, which sets into a shuttle or bobbin container. As the shuttle passes back and forth through the warp shed, it releases thread from a bobbin and so forms the filling cloth. Uh, so, yeah, it's hard to know exactly you know, these biblical terms and how they're used too. So there's lots of different parts in these modern sort of uh, looms, but yeah, a shuttle goes back and forth. So I'm not sure exactly how that differs from the, the pin. Okay. Anyway. We have some more things to address with this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we need to address today? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, We thank you for your guidance in this conversation today. We thank you for your guidance in this study. Help us now, Father, to consider that which we have been studying. Direct us in the path 
that you would have us to follow. Help us so that we may leave our hand in yours, so that we may be more properly walking in the path, so that your character is being revealed to all of those with whom we come in contact. Direct us to this end. Be with us, we pray. For this, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.